Hello there, and welcome to the 10th episode of the Biologic Podcast. Today I'll be talking about a very important process to all life called cellular respiration. In the last episode, I discussed the structure and function of ATP, and explained how it stores and releases usable energy. In this episode, I'll be exploring the generation of ATP through cellular respiration, which is the process of completely oxidizing a molecule of glucose for its chemical energy. When you respire, or respirate, you breathe in and out. You breathe in oxygen, and you breathe out carbon dioxide and water. Your cells do this too. To generate a molecule of ATP, cells must break down a molecule of glucose. ATP is unstable, so your cells don't store it. Instead, ATP is produced as it's needed with a small margin of surplus. The continual need for ATP causes cells to continually produce it, millions of times a minute. As a result, the cells continually consume molecular oxygen and glucose, and continually produce carbon dioxide and water as waste products. The collective respiration of all of your cells is manifested through your own respiratory rate. When you inhale, your lungs absorb oxygen. This oxygen is carried by your blood cells to be distributed to all of your tissues. Similarly, waste carbon dioxide is picked up from all of your tissues and carried by your blood cells back to the lungs where it's released and then exhaled. If you can't inhale, your body can't replenish the oxygen that your tissues need. Without oxygen, tissues become anoxic and they'll eventually necrify or die and begin rotting away. Without oxygen, most organisms like you and I would die as well. If you can't exhale, on the other hand, your body can't take the carbon dioxide out of your tissues. The carbon dioxide accumulates and eventually you succumb to hypercapnia or carbon dioxide poisoning. Your symptoms include a disorientation that turns to panic, you begin to hyperventilate before you fall unconscious, and on the floor, you start convulsing and then you die. Not breathing can quickly cause a host of serious problems, which is why you have to constantly be breathing. This is also why you can't hold your breath for more than a minute or so, and why you feel short of breath when doing physical exercise. When you're exercising, your cells are producing and using more energy and this means that they need more oxygen and they produce more carbon dioxide. You experience this as an increased respiratory rate, which is basically your body forcing you to serve more oxygen to your cells and clean out the carbon dioxide faster. But this episode is about cellular respiration, not the respiration of macroscopic organisms. So with that, let's dive into it. There are four main chemical pathways that are involved in cellular respiration. More specifically, the oxidation of a single glucose molecule is a process with four stages. Each stage is a chemical pathway with its own complex series of reactions. The complete process for total oxidation of the glucose molecule creates about 685 kilocalories of thermal energy. This is enough energy to boil more than two gallons of water starting at room temperature. Within the cell, this energy is not released all at once. If it were, the cell would literally explode. It would be like trying to contain a grenade by cupping your hands together. In order to not kill itself, the cell must slowly eat away at the glucose molecule and consume its total energy bit by bit. This is where the four stages come in. These stages are glycolysis, pyruvate processing, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain. Glycolysis produces two molecules of pyruvate, which are then processed into a chemical called acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA is processed in the citric acid cycle, eventually being converted into two molecules of CO2. During these stages, ATP is being produced, and various energy carrier proteins are being activated and put to work. A sequence of redox reactions harvests energy from the activated carriers, which creates a proton gradient across the cell's membrane. The end of the electron transport chain is capped with a reaction called oxidative phosphorylation, and this does something really cool. But I'm going to save this to the very end. It's going to be the surprise end to all of this chemical labor. So let's start at the very beginning, deep in the cytoplasm, with glycolysis. Recall that the word hydrolysis means a chemical reaction that uses a water molecule to break a bond. During this stage, the glucose molecule is being literally broken up into smaller pieces by enzymes at every step. In order to initiate glycolysis, the cell must first invest a little bit of energy. So the cell spends one ATP molecule, and this single molecule binds to the 6' carbon on the glucose molecule. 
If you watched the earlier episode about the chemistry of life, I explained systems for numbering atoms and molecules. This numbering makes it a lot easier to explain reactions. In this instance, I need you to imagine a hexagon, points on either side, flat edges on the top and bottom. Carbon atoms sit at each point in the hexagon ring, except for the oxygen in the upper right corner. The carbon to the right of this oxygen, on the far right point of the hexagon, is carbon number one, or one prime. The bottom right corner is carbon two, or two prime. Bottom left corner is carbon three prime. The left side corner is carbon four prime. And the last carbon in the ring before we come back to the oxygen is carbon five, or five prime. Attached to carbon five is carbon six, which comes out of the top of the plane of the ring. Carbon six is attached to a hydroxyl group, as are carbons one, two, three, and four. The hydroxyl groups all point out below the plane of the ring, except for the group on carbon three. Every valence electron left on the molecule is shared with hydrogen atoms. So in totality, this is the glucose molecule. This is the raw product with which cellular respiration begins. And the first step of cellular respiration involves that single ATP molecule, which is used by the enzyme hexokinase to phosphorylate the glucose molecule. The ATP becomes ADP, and the phosphate group which was broken off the ATP is now bound to carbon-6, and this creates glucose-6 phosphate. So you have your glucose molecule, and you have a phosphate group connected to carbon number 6, so the resultant molecule is glucose-6 phosphate. As I move through these chemical processes, you'll notice a lot of logical structure in the naming conventions for the chemicals. Glucose 6-phosphate literally means a glucose molecule with a phosphate group on its sixth carbon. In the second step, an enzyme called phosphoglucose isomerase removes the hydroxyl group on carbon 4, and switches the orientation of the hydroxyl groups on carbons 3, 2, and 1. Additionally, the hydrogen on carbon 1 is replaced with a carbon bound to two hydrogen atoms and a hydroxyl group. This creates fructose 6-phosphate. In the next step, the enzyme phosphofructokinase consumes an ATP to add a second phosphate group onto the molecule, and this produces fructose 1,6-biphosphate. The bi prefix in biphosphate signifies that the molecule has bonds with two phosphate groups instead of one. The two ATP molecules consumed so far are the cell's initial investment in the cellular respiration process. At this point, the process cannot be stopped. Various enzymes cause the sugar to revert back and forth between glucose and fructose 6-phosphate, but once that second phosphate group is added, this reversible change cannot happen anymore. The substrate molecule is now locked in to its metabolic pathway. At this point, an enzyme called fructose biphosphate aldolase breaks the sugar molecule into two smaller, similar pieces, a glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecule and a dihydroxyacetone phosphate molecule. The fifth reaction step involves the enzyme triose phosphate isomerase. This enzyme turns the dihydroxyacetone phosphate into a second glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecule. Both of these glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecules are then processed in the same way through the next few steps. Two electron carrier molecules called NAD+, or NAD+, are reduced, and one phosphate group is added to each glyceraldehyde molecule. These redox reactions are carried out by an enzyme called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. The reduction of NAD plus in the sixth step creates two molecules of NADH and two protons. In the seventh step, the enzyme phosphoglycerate kinase removes one of the phosphate groups from the substrate and adds it to ADP to make ATP. As two substrate molecules are processed for every glucose molecule, this step produces two molecules of ATP. The 2 ATP produced in this step recovers the initial energy investment that started the cycle, and the glycolysis process continues. The substrate molecule at the end of the seventh step is 3-phosphoglycerate, a humble carrier of just one phosphate group. In the eighth step, the enzyme phosphoglycerate mutase moves the phosphate group around in the molecule, creating 2-phosphoglycerate. The enzyme enolase then dehydrates the substrate molecule creating a carbon-carbon double bond, which creates the molecule phosphoenyl pyruvate. Finally, an enzyme called pyruvate kinase removes the last phosphate group and adds it to an ADP molecule. As before, this step produces two ATP per molecule of glucose, 
The substrate molecule is now pyruvate, which is the precursor molecule for the next stage of cellular respiration. Before I move on, I want to recap the glycolysis stage. It was pretty complicated, I went through it pretty quickly, and there was a lot of big names to cover, so I, I don't blame you if you got to go back and listen to it again, or if it, if it takes you a couple tries to kind of figure out what's going on. Glycolysis is it's a complicated process. So to summarize it a little more simply, a molecule of glucose is phosphorylated with an ATP, and this makes glucose 6-phosphate. This is modified into fructose 6-phosphate, and it's phosphorylated with another ATP molecule to make fructose 1,6-biphosphate. This is then split into two smaller molecules, each one possessing one of the two phosphate groups that were on the original molecule. Each molecule is then phosphorylated again, and this produces the substrate molecule 1,3-biphosphoglycerate. It also produces two molecules called NADH and two protons. One phosphate group is broken off of each molecule to make two ATP and two molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate. The remaining phosphate group is rearranged, making 2-phosphoglycerate. So all that means is that the ATP group in this step was moved from carbon 3' prime to carbon 2'. Prime. The molecule is then dehydrated, and a carbon-carbon double bond is enolated to create phosphoenyl pyruvate. The remaining phosphate group is removed to produce another ATP and a pyruvate molecule. This whole process consumes one glucose molecule and two ATP, and at the very end it produces two pyruvate molecules, two molecules of NADH, and four molecules of ATP. So basically, glycolysis takes one glucose molecule and then breaks it up into two pyruvate molecules, harvesting a little bit of energy in the process. The two pyruvate molecules produced by glycolysis are then used in the second stage of cellular respiration, imaginatively called pyruvate processing. This stage is much shorter than glycolysis, taking place in the mitochondria instead of the cell's cytoplasm. Pyruvate passes through both the outer and inner mitochondrial membranes, entering the mitochondrial matrix. Here, inside the guts of the mitochondria, exists a large enzyme complex called pyruvate dehydrogenase. This enzyme complex binds the pyruvate and another molecule called coenzyme A, or CoA for short. The pyruvate dehydrogenase complex facilitates a series of reactions that fuses pyruvate and coenzyme A together. So first, a molecule of carbon dioxide is cleaved off of the pyruvate, taking half of the non-hydrogen atoms in the pyruvate molecule with it. The electron carrier NAD plus is reduced to NADH, and this oxidizes the coenzyme A. So coenzyme A has a sulfhydryl group, which is used as the point of connection with pyruvate. The sulfur atom in this group is replaced with the carbon atom lost to the carbon dioxide, binding the pyruvate and the coenzyme A together into a single molecule called acetyl-CoA. Just as pyruvate is the precursor molecule for pyruvate processing, the acetyl-CoA molecule is the precursor for the citric acid cycle, the third stage of cellular respiration. Before I discuss the third stage, I want to briefly discuss a few more details of the second stage. Pyruvate processing is under numerous regulatory controls dependent on feedback from both earlier and later stages in the pathway. A high concentration of ATP in the cell will cause some ATP to phosphorylate the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, and this inactivates it. This phosphorylation happens more often when there are a high concentrations of the products of pyruvate processing, namely NADH and acetyl-CoA. This high concentration of ATP stops pyruvate processing, kind of like the cell's way of saying, hey, I have enough of this stuff, you can stop making it for now. On the other hand, if the reactants of pyruvate processing, like NAD plus and coenzyme A, exist at a high concentration, this tells the cell that its supplies of ATP are running low and that it should start making more. In this way, the concentrations of reactants or products influences the rate of pyruvate processing, regulating the rate of production of ATP. This is important to understand, because extreme levels of ATP can be dangerous for the cell. Extremely low levels and various metabolic pathways begin shutting down as they lack the energy to continue functioning. Extremely high levels of ATP will cause unregulated phosphorylation, wildly activating and inactivating proteins, like a child trying to fly a Boeing 747 by smashing all the controls. 
Pretty much all the chemical pathways in your body have regulatory mechanisms that prevent things from getting out of control like that. So having said that, I can move on to the third stage of cellular respiration, which is called the citric acid cycle. This cycle has eight steps, and each step modifies the substrate molecule a little bit, slowly oxidizing it. Like glycolysis and pyruvate processing, the metabolic pathway has several mechanisms for regulation. Just like the pyruvate processing, the concentration of ATP influences rates of respiratory processing. High concentrations of ATP tell the cell that it has enough, and ATP synthesis is slowed. Low concentrations of ATP tell the cell that it needs more, so ATP synthesis is accelerated. At high concentrations, ATP can bind and shut down various enzymes anywhere in the process. High concentrations of other products, like NADH, can also regulate the process by competitive inhibition with the substrate molecules. The first step in the citric acid cycle starts when an acetyl-CoA molecule binds to the citrate synthase enzyme. This enzyme also binds to oxaloacetate, the most oxidized product of the cycle. Citrate synthase takes the acetyl group on acetyl-CoA and transplants it onto the oxaloacetate, creating a citrate molecule. Citrate is the most reduced substrate molecule in the cycle. As the steps progress, the substrate is further and further oxidized until it becomes oxaloacetate, the most oxidized substrate, and gets reused in the next cycle. In the second step, the citrate is picked up by the aconitase enzyme, which dehydrates the hydroxyl group off of the central carbon. Aconitase then rehydrates the citrate by adding a hydroxyl group to an adjacent carbon, and this produces isocitrate. In the third step, the isocitrate molecule binds to an enzyme called isocitrate dehydrogenase. As the name suggests, this enzyme removes a hydrogen atom from the isocitrate, oxidizing it further. If something was oxidized, then something must have been reduced. In this case, the electron carrier NAD plus is reduced to NADH. This step also produces a carbon dioxide molecule as waste, the result of the 6-carbon isocitrate being ground down into the 5-carbon alpha-ketoglutarate. The next step, step 4, is functionally identical to step 3. The alpha-ketoglutarate molecule is bound to the enzyme alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. You probably noticed that both this one and the previous enzyme have the same end term, dehydrogenase. This term implies that the enzyme is an oxidoreductase, which oxidizes molecules by removing hydrogen atoms. The alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase enzyme strips a hydrogen atom from the alpha-ketoglutarate, and slaps it onto an NAD plus molecule to produce NADH. Like step three, this process also produces a waste carbon dioxide molecule, which grinds the five carbon alpha ketoglutarate down into a four carbon molecule. This four carbon molecule binds with coenzyme A to produce a molecule called succinyl CoA. At this point in the citric acid cycle, we've only gone up to step four. Step 5 involves an enzyme called succinyl-CoA synthetase, which removes the coenzyme A group. This reaction releases a little bit of energy, which is used to grab inorganic phosphate ions and ADP from the solution and slap them together to produce ATP. So step 5 is the first step in the citric acid cycle that actually generates any ATP. This step can also produce a similar energy molecule called GTP. ATP is adenosine triphosphate. The adenosine component is a nucleotide base. GTP uses the guanine nucleotide base. GDP is guanine diphosphate, and GTP is guanine triphosphate. Like ATP, GTP can be tapped for the energy in its third phosphate group. Anyways, the succinyl-CoA synthetase removes the coenzyme A group, and this converts the substrate into a molecule of succinate. In the sixth step, the succinate is oxidized by the enzyme succinate dehydrogenase. Two hydrogen atoms are removed from the succinate molecule and given to the electron carrier FAD to produce FADH2. The removal of the two hydrogen atoms creates a double bond between the two central carbons in the succinate molecule, converting it into a molecule of fumarate. In the seventh step, the enzyme fumarase facilitates the addition of a water molecule to fumarate which breaks the double bond and gives the substrate a hydroxyl group, converting it to malate. The eighth and final step of the cycle involves the oxidation of malate by the enzyme malate dehydrogenase. It should be obvious by now that enzymes with dehydrogenase in the name are oxidizing. 
This oxidation uses NAD plus to produce NADH and converts the malate to oxaloacetate, the molecule which binds to acetyl-CoA in the first step of the cycle. Okay, so that was a lot of material, more than glycolysis. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna recap this a little bit. Pyruvate processing creates a two carbon molecule called acetyl-CoA, which then binds with oxaloacetate to produce the six carbon citrate in the first step of the cycle. Citrate is converted to isocitrate, and then it's converted to alpha-ketoglutarate in a process that produces a molecule of NADH. Alpha-ketoglutarate is converted to succinyl-CoA in a process that also produces a molecule of NADH. Succinyl-CoA is converted to succinate in a process that produces a molecule of either ATP or GTP. Succinate is converted to fumarate, which produces a molecule of FADH2. Fumarate is converted to malate, and then to oxaloacetate with a third NADH byproduct. The oxaloacetate is then used again with a new acetyl-CoA to restart the cycle. One whole revolution of the citric acid cycle, all eight steps, yields one molecule of ATP, one molecule of FADH2, and three molecules of NADH. High concentrations of ATP or NADH can regulate the cycle through negative feedback. ATP can phosphorylate and disable the enzymes working in steps 1, 3, and 4, by downregulating the production of more ATP. NADH can downregulate the cycle by engaging in competitive inhibition with the substrates in steps 3 and 4. Recall that steps 3 and 4 each produced a molecule of carbon dioxide as waste, and when each of those molecules was released, the substrate had one less carbon atom. Acetyl-CoA brings fresh carbon atoms into this cycle, while this exhalation of carbon dioxide takes carbon atoms out of the cycle. In this way, individual carbon atoms are slowly shuffled through the organism. Food is eaten, providing nutrients and energy which is stored as glucose. Glucose is stored in muscle tissue, being tapped when it's needed. The glucose molecule is metabolized through these pathways, having its carbon atoms spun through several citric acid cycles before finally being expelled through an exhalation. When you engage in strenuous physical activity like weightlifting, your body literally breaks down muscle tissue for energy. You dissolve your own flesh for its energy, and you shed all the waste gases out of your mouth. For that matter, virtually all animals do this too. All living things unconsciously use their bodies like mobile nutrient stores, consuming the molecules in their tissues for energy while expelling the waste products. In this way, organisms have a dynamic consistency. They keep the same form and shape, but internally, they roil with constant cyclical movement on the molecular level, constantly incorporating the new while cycling out the old, the cells squeezing out and harvesting as much energy from the whole process as they possibly can. So this brings me to the last stage of cellular respiration, the payoff stage, called the electron transport chain. So far, cellular respiration has only generated four molecules of ATP per molecule of glucose. It's also produced electron carriers, specifically two molecules of FADH2 and 10 molecules of NADH. You might be wondering what all those weird electron carrier molecules are, or what their purpose is. I've mentioned two of them so far, NAD+, and FAD, or FAD, with their reduced forms being NADH and FADH2, respectively. In the electron transport chain, both NADH and FADH2 are harvested for their electrons. A series of increasingly electronegative enzymes shuttles these electrons to an oxygen atom, ultimately creating a molecule of water. This process of harvesting electrons through a series of redox reactions creates a lot of energy. A lot of energy. So let's start right at the beginning. A suite of proteins and coenzymes embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane receive the electron carriers and process the electrons. These proteins and coenzymes are organized into four groups of proteins called complexes. I'm going to throw a lot of chemical names and acronyms at you now, so buckle up. The chain starts when NADH donates an electron to an FMN protein, then to an iron and sulfur containing protein called FES. This pair of proteins composes complex 1, which is also called NADH dehydrogenase. The electron carrier FADH2 gives an electron directly to an FES protein, complex 2. Complex 2 is called succinate dehydrogenase, 
and it's also used in step 6 of the citric acid cycle to oxidize succinate. Anyway, the FES proteins then give the electrons to a coenzyme called ubiquinone. Ubiquinone, or Q for short, is a lipid-soluble, non-protein quinone molecule, common in most cells. So ubiquinone, or Q, is lipid-soluble, so it's hydrophobic. It hangs out in relatively high concentrations inside the inner mitochondrial membrane, floating between the phosphate groups and the other proteins in the electron transport chain. This intermediate position helps Q facilitate electron transport. Complex 1 and 2 both expel oxidized NAD plus and FAD molecules, respectively, back into the mitochondria, where they're reused in other reactions. So complex 1 and complex 2 have both taken an electron from their electron carrier, and they've given their electrons to Q, ubiquinone. After being reduced by taking on the electrons, as well as a number of protons, Q floats through the membrane before being oxidized by complex 3, called cytochrome C reductase. This protein complex shuttles electrons one at a time across a series of protons called, in order, cytochrome B, another FES protein, and cytochrome C1. For each pair of electrons, the cytochrome C reductase complex moves four protons into the intermembrane space. This is the space between the inner and outer mitochondrial membranes. Complex 3 reduces a protein called cytochrome C, which moves across the outer surface of the inner membrane, searching for complex 4. The cytochrome C is oxidized by complex 4, which is why it's also called cytochrome C oxidase. See, these names have logical structure. Cytochrome C oxidase oxidizes cytochrome C. So complex 4 has a protein called cytochrome A, which oxidizes cytochrome C and shuttles its electrons to a second protein called cytochrome A3. From here, the electrons are used to reduce molecular oxygen, or O2. This reduction of molecular oxygen ends the electron transport chain by creating two water molecules, supplying the energy for another two protons to be pumped into the intermembrane space. You might have noticed that at complex 1, 2, and 4, protons are constantly being moved across the inner mitochondrial membrane, from the matrix into the intermembrane space. It isn't fully understood how the protein complexes pump proteins across the inner mitochondrial membrane, but we do understand the raw significance of this. By pumping protons into the intermembrane space, it creates a proton concentration gradient. The concentration of protons is high in the intermembrane space, so the rules of diffusion suggest that the protons will exhibit a net movement across the inner membrane and into the mitochondrial matrix, where the concentration of protons is much lower. It's lower in part because the protons in the matrix are being actively pumped out. The proton motive force is the force of the protons moving across the membrane as part of this gradient. This force can be exploited by various enzyme complexes to fuel their reactions. The most important of these complexes is ATP synthase. ATP synthase has two protein parts, called F1 and F0. F1 is often called a knob because of its doorknob-like appearance. F0 is a tube-like structure embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. The F1 and F0 proteins are connected by two structures, a rotating shaft that's turned by the rotation of F0, and a stator, a piece that holds the subunits together. So the F0 protein facilitates the rapid transport of protons across the membrane, following their concentration gradient. As the protons move through the interior of the F0 protein, as they move through this tube, they cause it to turn, they cause it to spin. This spinning causes the rotational shaft to spin as well, and it reaches speeds of up to about 350 rotations a second. The shaft sits within the center of the F1 region. Its rotation doesn't cause the F1 to spin, but it does cause the subunits of the F1 protein to undergo a conformation shift. This conformation shift allows the F1 region to catalyze the phosphorylation of ADP, producing molecules of ATP. In this way, ATP synthase operates exactly like a river turbine. The protons are like the stream of water, coming downhill, or down their concentration gradient, where they push through the river turbine, turning it and producing energy. ATP synthase, however, can work in reverse. If the proton concentration gradient is reversed, where diffusion moves protons out of the matrix and into the intermembrane space, ATP synthase can work backwards, 
hydrolyzing ATP for the energy it needs to pump proteins back out and reestablish the gradient. Remember how I said that the first three stages of cellular respiration only produce four ATP molecules per molecule of glucose? This really isn't that much ATP, especially when the cell has to invest two ATP molecules just to get everything started. The electron transport chain doesn't produce any ATP at all. It just creates a proton gradient that gets exploited by ATP synthase. It's the ATP synthase that produces a boatload of ATP. But how much ATP can ATP synthase synthesize? The answer is more than six times as much as the rest of cellular respiration put together. ATP synthase creates up to 25 ATP molecules per molecule of glucose, which means the entire process of cellular respiration, with all four of its stages and the oxidative phosphorylation at the end, produces about 29 molecules of ATP per molecule of glucose. When you hear that glucose is an energy storage molecule, this is how that energy is harvested on a chemical level. This is what it produces, 29 molecules of ATP. So a million molecules of glucose will yield 29 million molecules of ATP. That's not a bad exchange rate. It makes sense why we share an endosymbiotic relationship with mitochondria. The first symbiotes would have provided enormous benefits to one another. The cell gives nutrients and protection to the prokaryotic mitochondria in exchange for a hugely improved energy generation system. This endosymbiotic relationship was so useful and beneficial that it's persisted in all eukaryotes to this day, enabling the large and complex life forms that we see around us. Every single cell in your body is an endosymbiote packed with many tens to thousands of mitochondria. I want to end this episode by very briefly talking about fermentation. It's a less potent energy production mechanism that doesn't require oxygen. Fermentation is an anaerobic process conducted in low oxygen or oxygen-free environments. You probably know that fermentation is used to create bread and alcoholic drinks. Fermentation is kind of like a backup energy production system in eukaryotic cells for when the electron transport chain fails or is overloaded or otherwise disabled. Fermentation can produce ATP, but not nearly as efficiently as the oxidative phosphorylation at the end of the electron transport chain. Cellular respiration produces 29 ATP per glucose, but fermentation only produces 2 ATP per glucose. It produces a lot of waste, too. When you're breathing hard and engaged in strenuous physical activity, your muscle cells are working to bring oxygen in and push carbon dioxide out as fast as possible. If these strenuous conditions continue, your muscle cells will become less and less able to provide the necessary oxygen, making your tissues oxygen stressed. In this environment, your muscles begin to produce lactic acid as a waste product of a fermentation process. Fermentation involves the recycling of the NAD plus and NADH molecules involved in glycolysis. Pyruvate, or sometimes a modified intermediate molecule, will oxidize NADH back to NAD plus. After oxidizing NADH, the pyruvate or pyruvate derivative is converted into a waste product like lactic acid or ethanol, where it's then broken down or expelled. So basically glycolysis produces two ATP and two NADH, as well as two molecules of pyruvate. The pyruvate molecules either directly oxidize the NADH produced in glycolysis, or they're modified slightly before oxidizing the NADH produced by fermentation. Either way, the NADH gets oxidized back into NAD+, which can then be used again in future glycolysis cycles. In muscle cells, the pyruvate oxidizes the NADH and becomes lactic acid. Yogurt cultures also ferment lactose into lactic acid, which gives the yogurt its creamy texture. In yeast, a carbon dioxide is removed to produce acetaldehyde, which then oxidizes NADH to become ethanol. Humans are facultative anaerobes, meaning we can use fermentation when our tissues have low levels of oxygen, like in my example about the muscle tissue. Some species, like some of the anaerobic microbes living in your gut, produce all of their energy through fermentation processes. You eat food, the microbes help break it down and get their cut of nutrients, and you get your share of the nutrients and the energy you wouldn't have been able to biologically access without those microbes. Well, that's about it for this episode. I know it was a kind of a more technical episode, but I wanted you to know the enzyme complexes, the substrate molecules, and the waste products used in every step of cellular respiration. 
If you have to listen to this episode a couple times before you think you fully understand it, that's totally fine. It's a complicated subject, and there's a lot of details that you need to pay attention to. Anyway, I hope you learned something cool about the way cells generate and use energy. As always, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and subscribe. Share the episode with a teacher, a friend, or a classmate. If you want to support the show, follow us on social media and consider buying something from the official store. Follow us on Twitter. Our username is at Biologic Podcast. To buy something from the store, go to redbubble.com and search for Biologic. Or go directly to the store at redbubble.com slash people slash biologic slash shop. Become an official patron of the show. Sign up at patreon.com slash biologic podcast. Your support really helps the show. So if you like it, send us some love. And as always, thanks for listening. Thank you.